Why don't you just stand to your feet as we come around the word? And I want us to just declare this prayer right at the start because God's word is amazing. But the reality is that the Bible is not like any other book. With this book, you need the author to walk alongside you as you read it in order to understand it. Yeah? It's not like any other book that you can just read and kind of understand and use literature, you know, use them, the tools to analyze, to really get the life of this book. The author of the book has to be reading it alongside you. And God's word is in this book. And the Spirit of God, the Bible said, inspired writers to write these words. So... This is a prayer we pray every day in our family devotion, and most of you would know it. It's just a scripture. So if you say this after me, open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. We're going to pray it again. Open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. Amen. Amen and amen. Please take your seats. So we are carrying on in the book of Acts. We are in Acts chapter 12 now. So far, we have seen God move in amazing ways in the early church. We've seen the Spirit of God being poured out at Pentecost and the people speaking in so many languages that people were thinking they were drunk. But Peter spoke God's word and so many have been added to the church. We've also seen some dark times with Stephen being stoned to death. And um, we talked about just how the gospel also then had gone out to the Gentiles. And Peter having those dreams to eat, you know, and kill and eat. Um, and then God pouring out his spirit um, on the Gentiles. In Cornelius' house, God pouring out his spirit. So, so many things have been happening here so far. But we are picking up in Acts chapter 12. And um, if we just have the first slide, which has... Um, Acts chapter 12, yes. So just the first four verses. And if we can just read these verses together. Acts chapter 12, 1 to 4. Let's do it together. Let's go. It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with a sword. When he saw that this met with approval among the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened of unleavened bread. After arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. So, have you ever been at a stage in your life where you felt like so much was going on so well for you? Life was good, family life was good, you got the job of your dreams, and you're in your perfect health, everything seemed so perfect. And then suddenly, it looks like one thing after the other begins to happen, and it just looks like bad news, bad news, more bad news, and you wonder what is going on. And I think if you've ever, ever experienced that, you can relate to what we've read just now. We saw that the gospel was spreading, and in verse 1 it says, it was about this time, and you've got to think it was about this time, what time? So you've got to read earlier chapters, and we see that the gospel had spread from the Jews, and now the Gentiles had come to know the Lord, the Spirit of God has been poured out, so things are going so well when you think about the spread of the gospel, and it's about that time when things were going so well, when the Gentiles are coming to know Jesus, when the Spirit of God is being poured out, and some of the religious ideologies were being cast down, like what Henry was preaching about last week. It was about this time, when they were on a high, suddenly, it says here, King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church. And who is this King Herod? This is King Herod Agrippa, who was the grandson of Herod the Great. Herod the Great was the one that was ruling when Jesus um, was born. It was about this time, when it all was looking so good, he arrested so, persecution again. Not just from the time of Stephen, not just with Paul, um, with Paul um, Saul at the time, but once again, persecution coming this time through Herod. 
And persecution did not end with the early church. In fact, as we'll see, that it should come up on the slide, 2 Timothy 3.12, it says on there, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Wow. That's not a very great promise you want to hang on to. You know, we're counting the promises of God. I don't think you, yeah, ex- I don't think anyone reads that one and say, I'm standing on the promise of God. I will be persecuted. <laughs> you don't declare that one. But he says, everyone who wants to live a godly life, and I want you to, to look at those words. I love the Bible. It's very specific. I like the way the words are. It says, everyone who wants to live a godly life. It's not just everyone. It's not just everyone. Everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, because (laughs) the Bible says, not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven, which means there may be many on a wide road, but maybe just a few that have made up their mind that I want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus. And when you set your eyes on that, suddenly things start shaking around you. Suddenly, because you've made up your mind, I've decided to follow Jesus, not just to go along for the ride, not just to click, I've attended church today, but actually I'm going to change my lifestyle. I am going to be hungry for God. I am going to spend my time praying. I'm going to spend my time in the Word. I'm going to change things in my life that do not align with the Word. The moment you say, I want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, then be assured, persecution is going to come. Tony Evans says it this way, and it should come on there on the screen. Wherever the Holy Spirit is at work, and believers are living in faithfulness to God, ungodly resistance will eventually rear its ugly head. And that's the truth. The devil is not bothered about things that are failing. He's not bothered about those who are already in his camp. He's bothered about when the saints, when God's people are, you know, you're excited. You're like, yes, I've made a decision to follow Jesus. Yes, I'm going to do God's will. I'm going to obey him. And when you're in that state, suddenly... When you have a church that says, we're going to follow Jesus, we're going to do what God wants us to do, suddenly. So, what are we going to focus on today? We're going to focus on drawing a few lessons that I feel God just laid on my heart. Because when we look at this church in Acts chapter 12, we can learn something from the church when persecution arose. When you read the whole of that book, I think to me, I draw an overall theme of a church that would not give up, a church that would not give in, a church that says no matter what's going on around us, we will remain faithful to our king. We will remain faithful to the cause that we've been given. They did not let go. And that's why I've titled the message today, Don't Give Up. And Anna gave my message today because she said, don't give up whatever is happening. So don't give up. Why don't you turn to somebody, if someone's close enough to where you're sitting, and say, don't give up. (laughs) Yeah, turn to another person. Don't give up. You might be prophesying into their life today. So, you know, let's, let's speak the word. Don't give up. So... I'm going to talk about four things that I believe God is saying we should not give up in the midst of our trials, in the midst of persecution. Four things. First thing, don't give up your faith. Don't give up your faith. In Acts 12, verse 5, so Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. That means the church carried on. They carried on trusting God. They didn't say, what? Peter has been put in prison. That's it. We're out of here. 
Okay? No. They carried on. They were faithful. It says that they prayed earnestly for Peter. Remember, when we started in verse 1, it says that James had already been taken by Herod and that James had been put to death. So the church could have said, what? James is gone. Now, Peter is in prison. We think he's probably going to be killed because obviously Herod was planning to bring him out later. So they could have said, well, what kind of God is this that allows faithful men like this to be killed? It was Stephen, a couple of, I don't know what the timeline was between Stephen and this, but let's say weeks, days, months, whatever. It was Stephen, now good James that has been faithful, and then Peter, our leader, what kind of God is this? We don't want to follow Jesus anymore. Have you ever been disappointed because maybe somebody you, you, you looked up to, something has happened in their life and you think, what kind of God is this? Or maybe you've lost somebody really dear to you that was faithful to God. I still remember when my mom died tragically, you know, I was 17 at the time, and she died in a, a, a motor accident, and it was horrible, it was horrible, it was such a horrible thing because they went over the bridge, we couldn't even, well, in, 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 our, in our funerals, we normally would have like an, an open casket, but we couldn't even do that because of the damage. And I remember she was coming back from a... a a women's convention. She had gone to the camp. She was coming back from something where she went to serve God. How can a good God allow that woman to die? You know, when things go wrong like that, the enemy starts to whisper something in our ears. And if we're not careful, we can begin to turn our attention and we lose our faith. Remember, he's after our faith. And we can begin to blame God. We can begin to say, well, if God could allow that to happen, well, I don't think I can serve God. But you know, sometimes when those things happen, you just think and you say, great is thy faithfulness. Oh God, my Father, there is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not Thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed. Has provided great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Don't give up your faith. When those trials come, when those fiery things come, and you think, How is this happening to me? I have been giving my tithes, I've been praying, I've been living for Jesus. Why will this come my way? Remember, God is with you in the midst of that trial. The Bible says in Romans 8, 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sod? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, whatever that is, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. A big amen to that. Amen to that. Second thing, 
Don't give up praying in faith. <laughs> I put that specifically in faith. Not just praying, but praying in faith. Acts 12, we see it there, verse 5, it says that they prayed earnestly. That means that they prayed with expectation. I don't know about you, but I can definitely put my hands up that there are some times I've prayed without expectation. I've just prayed because, okay, let's pray. Okay, I'm going to pray. But not really expecting something to change. God wants us to pray in faith. You know, going back to the fact that James had died, the fact that James had died could have so yes, they may not have left the faith, but it may have dampened their trust that God can do that, that God can actually save somebody in that. Because it's, I believe they must have prayed for James. They wouldn't have loved James any less than they loved Peter. The church must have prayed. Yeah, they must have prayed. And they prayed, and yet James was killed. So they could have said, well, what are we praying about this? If James died... What is the point of praying and expecting anything different this time around? But I thank God that they prayed. And they kept on praying earnestly. The Bible talks about Elijah being a man like us. But then he prayed fervently that it would not rain. And it did not rain for, was it three and a half years? Yeah. He prayed. You know, when we read it in the Old Testament, it just says, Elijah the Tishbite said to Ahab, you know, there will not be rain or dew except by my word. It doesn't really give you the context, but then James tells us that he prayed fervently. Before he could go there and stand and say such a thing, he had done his job in the secret place, praying. He had prayed. Do not give up praying in faith. I want to challenge you today. If there's a situation around you and you have given up, you have said, well... I prayed for my dear friend a couple of years ago. She, she was sick or he was sick or, you know, a child was sick and they never got well. Well, I'm not going to bother doing that anymore. I want to say to you today, keep on praying in faith. Amen. If you go on the next slide, it says, um, prayer is the divinely authorized method for accessing heavenly authority for earthly intervention. I love that. Ian Bounds, who is well known for his writings on prayer and for praying, you know, himself. He says, prayer affects three different spheres of existence, the divine, the angelic, and the human. It puts God to work, it puts angels to work, and it puts man to work. Well, let's see how that works out in our reading today. So Acts 12, 5 to 11. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. The night before Herod was about to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and sentries stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Get quick, get up, he said, and the chains fell off Peter's wrist. Already, the angels are at work, God is at work. Yeah? Then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals. And Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. Peter followed him out of the prison, but he had no idea that what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. They passed the first and second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself and they went through it. When they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. Then Peter came to himself and said, Now I know without a doubt that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were hoping to happen. Hallelujah. What a deliverance. What a deliverance. You know, it says there that the, the, the believers were, they didn't believe actually it was Peter, you know, when, when he came to the door. And many years ago, when I used to have this passage preached, a lot of times people would say, maybe they didn't have faith. But I wonder, maybe what they were praying for was not necessarily Peter to be saved from the prison, but maybe we were saying, Peter would not give up his faith. Peter would stand firm in his trials and all of that. And God did something wonderful. So 1 Thessalonians 5.16 says to us, 
Rejoice always. Pray continually. I like the old King James without season, yeah? Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So keep praying in faith, even when it doesn't seem like anything is happening. Remember Asher's testimony and Thomas in there, the doctor saying there's no evidence of life, but they kept on praying. Amen. All right, two more and then we'll round up. I'll be quick now. Don't give up your calling. Don't give up your calling. I probably won't be able to read all the verses, but don't give up your calling. In Acts chapter 12, and that should come up, Acts 12, the next slide, on here you would see that when Peter realized that he had been delivered, he didn't say, ha, 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 that was a close shave, I'm out of here. Okay, no one is going to ever hear of Peter anymore, I'm going under. No, when it happened, he went to the believers. He Encourage them by telling them what God had done. And then he says, share it with the brethren. Tell James, tell the other brothers and sisters. And then towards the end of verse 17, he said he left for another place. Peter carried on with the call. And why do we know this? Because if you go on to the next slide, we see in 1 Peter 1, which would have been a while after this, Peter is writing. And he says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. To God's elect, exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia. The point being that Peter carried on as an apostle of Jesus Christ. He didn't stop doing what God had called him to do because trials came and he was in prison. He carried on doing what God has called him to do. Look at the wonderful things he writes in 1 Peter 4, 12. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come to you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed. For the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. He was speaking from experience. He had been through trials and he remained faithful to his calling. I really believe, you know, when I was preparing this, I really believed in my heart that there were some of us today, you've been through trials, you've been through disappointment, you've been through situations, you were once on fire for God, you were serving, you were ready to go wherever he'll send you, and suddenly now, you're cold. You've not left the faith, you're present, but the fire is gone. You were once going to do it. You have said yes. You were doing it. Whatever it is God had asked you to do. And then you got disappointed. The trials came. And you've cooled down. Jesus is saying to you, Agnes, John, Tom, Simon, do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than all these things going on? Because the only thing that keeps us going when the trials come and keeps us still doing what God has called us to do is that we love him more than anything else. It's love. Love kept Jesus on the cross. Love is what keeps us on the journey, faithful to our master. Peter had already been tried. Jesus had already asked him, do you love me more than these? He asked him three times. And then on the back of that, he said, Follow me. Hmm. And the last point, do, don't give up focus on the bigger picture. I end with this. Don't give up focus on the bigger picture. You know, when we go through trials, we can sometimes think it's about us. We live in a world where we're told to do you. Have you heard that? You do you, I do me. You come across, yeah, you, 
Yeah, have you? I might even have said it, yeah? Say, I, I want to tell my truth. You tell your truth. We have a focus on us. But do you know, this may sound surprising, but it really is not about you. It's actually not about you. The enemy is not fighting you, just you as a person. He is fighting God's purpose. That is what he's after. He was not after James and Peter and Stephen. He was after the spread of the kingdom of God. He didn't want you to hear that Jesus is the Savior. He didn't want me to hear that Jesus is the Savior because he knew that if these people remain faithful, one day this gospel will go around the world and thousands of years later we'll be sat here in Derby, in the United Kingdom, praising God, worshiping God. He was trying to abort that purpose. That's what it was about. Look at Acts 12, 21. Herod here, the one who had, you know, killed James, is wearing his royal robes, he sits on his throne, the people, he delivers his address, the people say, this is the voice of a God, not man, immediately he's struck. But let us read verse 24 together, let's read it together. But the word of God continued to spread and flourish, hallelujah, (laughs) the devil failed, he failed. Can I suggest to you that whatever it is you're going through right now that may seem tough, whatever is going on around our world today, it is not just about us. It is about the kingdom of God. It's about the purposes of God. And when you turn your eyes, like that song says, turn your eyes on Jesus, look full in his face. When you turn your gaze away from me and mine and us, suddenly you begin to see there is something more that God is doing. In the midst of the pandemic, many are coming to Christ. Many are opening up their heart and being willing to hear about this Jesus after all. In the midst of a pandemic. In the midst of that pain, in the midst of the shifting in the church, God is doing something new. Because nothing can stop the advance of the kingdom of God. We already know it. He is victorious. When I look back at my life, there was God's story. Yes, I must have been, what, I don't know, 14 when my elder elder sister died. Shocking. Three years or so later, my mom passes with no notice. No, it's not like she was sick. What if the enemy took me out at that point? What if I gave up my faith? Would I be here today? What if I decided I'll still be a believer, but I would just sit on the sidelines? You know, when I was preparing this preach, it was really personal to me. I think probably because yesterday, my dad would have been 80 yesterday, you know. And I think I put something on Facebook, some people would have seen it. And I was just thinking about my life. And I realized that actually, when you think of it, I I couldn't get away from it. It's like the words of that song, I love you, Lord, because your mercies never fail. All my days have been kept in your hand. From the moment that I wake up to the moment I lay my head, in fact, I'm going to sing of the goodness of God. Because all my life, you have been faithful. All my life, you've been so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. Can I invite you to stand on your feet? And we're going to read this scripture together. It's going to come up on the screen. Revelation 7, 9 to 10. And this is where we're going to end. It's about the big picture. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about the purposes of God. And this is what we're going to see. A day is coming when we're going to see this. So let's read it together. After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, 
people and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Why don't you begin to worship God? Live where you are, just lift. Oh, hallelujah. Glory to our God. Glory. Glory to our God. Glory to our God. It's about His kingdom. It's about His purpose. It's about His plan. It's about the day that we will all stand and worship the King of kings and Lord of lords. Can I encourage you? Don't give up your faith. Don't give up praying in faith. Don't give up your calling, what God has called you to do. And don't give up your focus on the bigger picture. Because it's about the kingdom of God. So today, we're going to pray. And maybe for you, maybe you don't yet know Jesus. We're talking about don't give up your faith. But maybe you've not got there yet. Maybe you've heard about Jesus. Maybe someone's been coming alongside you, talking to you, walking with you. But maybe you've not yet known Jesus. And I want to give you that opportunity to do that. And then we will end with a prayer that we will not give up no matter what's going on and trust God for miracles. I, I, I really will be remiss if I don't say this now, but I, I forgot to say it, but this morning, I don't know, I think God wanted me to give, give it, just have a taste of this. I woke up this morning and I was doubled over. I was in pain. I was in pain. I couldn't stand. I was, my tongue, my left side was so, I was just like this. And I was thinking, huh, I'm preaching today. How, how is this going to happen? So I thought, oh, okay, I'll just do a few things. And maybe, and I'm like, I couldn't. And at one stage, I just went on the side of the bed and I said to Henry, I'm in pain. I'm in pain. And he said, let me pray for you. And he prayed a simple prayer. It's a simple prayer. And I said, I'm going to go down and see if I can start praying and, you know, doing a normal preparation for, for the morning. And I managed to get myself downstairs. And I just sat there. I sat there. I couldn't even pray. I couldn't prepare. I just sat there. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus. And I tell you, it wasn't have been about 10 minutes later, suddenly, nothing, nothing, no pain. At all, no pain. I legged it upstairs. Hen Henry said, Oh, is it getting worse? Is there? I said, No, <laughs> there's no pain. There's no pain anymore. Ah, oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Ah, let's give God praise. Give him praise. Give him praise. Give him praise. So why don't you lift your hands to God now? How has he spoken to you this morning? What is he saying to you? What is he saying to you? What is he saying to you? Ah, the Spirit of the Lord is here. He's doing his business in your heart. If you will just allow him today. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Are you that person that wants to know Jesus today? Then today could be that day. And if you're going through trials today, then I want to pray that you will feel the presence of God with you and that God will do a miracle in your situation. Amen. He's a God that is able to do more than we can ask or imagine and He can come into your situation today if we will trust Him and believe Him. Amen. Amen. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. 
Holy Spirit, walk through every role right now, Lord. Walk through every role, every aisle right now. Just walk through, walk through. Do a work in our hearts this morning because you are here. Because you are here. Oh, fill many afresh with your spirit. Fill us afresh. Give us that grace we need to stand firm no matter what comes our way. Because you are a faithful God. Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Ah, oh, thank you, Lord. You are here right now. You are here right now. You are here right now. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. It's not about us, it's about your glory. It's not about us, it's about your kingdom. It's not about us, it's that all men will be saved. All men, white, black, brown, whatever color, that we will all bow at the feet of Jesus and declare that there is no other name given amongst men whereby we may be saved. So pour afresh on each one now, I pray. Pour your spirit afresh. Refresh our hearts. And for anyone that doesn't yet know you, that today will be the day of salvation. I know the time is fast spent this morning, but I'm going to pray and then just kind of say if we just stay in this and if you actually need some prayer then come and if you want to give your heart to Jesus then come I'm not going to try and you know work it but I really sense the spirit of God is here with us right now I don't know if you sense that as well but I, I really feel that God is doing business with us so I don't want to rush out but I'm going to pray and obviously if you do need to leave that's fine but Lord, I thank you this morning. Thank you because your presence is here with us. Thank you because you are touching us, you are shaping us, you are making us into the men and women you want us to be. And I thank you for it. I thank you for it. Lord, today you have spoken to us and I believe each one of us has been challenged in one way or the other. And I'm asking that we will just be doers of your word. That this will provoke an action in us, oh God. Not just an acknowledgement that this is a good word, but that we will do something. We will obey whatever it is you're laying on our hearts. I pray for anyone where today is the first time they're thinking, I want to follow Jesus. Then Lord, I'm saying that there will be that boldness to come at the end of this so that we can declare, yes, I am committed to following Jesus. Have your way, Lord. I pray for anyone that feels that they're in a trial, in a prison, in the midst of a battle. We pray for miracles this week. We pray that when we come again, there'll be testimonies of breakthrough, testimonies of transformation in the lives of men and women. Thank you because you're a good, good God. We worship you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, Amen. 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 Amen.